Hello everyone and welcome to Dementia Basics. This is our sixth session series about dementia. My name is Herman Chique Alfonso and I'm the Education and Program Coordinator for the Dementia Society of Ottawa in Renfrew County. It's my pleasure to be your host and thank you for watching this video. During six sessions in a row, you will gain knowledge about dementia those key concepts. This workshop is divided in three main sections. So the first section, part one, two, and three, it's called the science of dementia, where you will learn from the basic structure of the neuron, the brain, and also how our brain changes as we age, different types of dementia, the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia, for example, and what clinical trials are happening in Ottawa. Then we will move into a second section called Understanding and Management of Behavioral and Psychological Symptoms of Dementia. And finally, the third section, it's mainly on caregivers. So is the caregiver's contribution. I highly recommend you to watch these presentations and the videos provided on demand and attend to the session's uh, schedule. So the, this, the format of this session will be a 25 minutes presentation with a question and answer period. So you can solve and ask the experts about different topics. The following video is Dr. Andrew Frank talking about the aging brain. Thank you for watching again. It's really nice to be with everyone this afternoon. Thank you for spending some time with us. Um, I'm Dr. Andrew Frank. I'm a neurologist at the Briere Memory Program at Briere Hospital in Ottawa. My practice specializes in memory testing and determining uh, if anyone has risk for or has the early signs of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Yes. As we know with the uh, aging population, the risk of dementia and Alzheimer's is increasing. And uh, there are so many in society who are wondering if they have it. And there are so many uh, whose families have been affected as well. And so all of that generates intense interest um, in memory and Alzheimer's and in anything that comes through the news and media as to any developments or breakthroughs in terms of new treatments. The search for new treatments for Alzheimer's has been uh, intensely interesting to me uh, over the past uh, 13 years that I've been uh, at the clinic. And uh, even to this day, we are engaged in a number of clinical trials testing new medicines for Alzheimer's, both at the earliest stages and at the middle stages and even late stages in hopes of trying to find new treatments which are so desperately needed. As we know, there's no cure yet, and we want that so badly to, to help all those affected. Um, the goal, of course, is to um, identify Alzheimer's and dementia at the earliest stages, and then start a treatment which would hopefully interfere with the chemistry or bio chemistry of Alzheimer's, and we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. Uh, if we could identify it early and start a treatment uh, early, then perhaps we could save the brain and that all of us could enjoy a long life without having to be affected by Alzheimer's and dementia, which as many of you already know, can develop and take hold over a period of 10 years or more during which that time an individual can be robbed of so many of their functioning, their independence, and that they must live in that situation for so many years, maybe even developing symptoms in their 70s, 
sometimes even in their 60s. And despite being very physically healthy, losing so much memory because of a biochemical problem in the brain, which is called Alzheimer's, should there, should there, is there not a way to interfere with that biochemistry and keep the brain healthy? And that's been my goal for the past 13 years. The problem has been is that this, well, the brain in general, which we'll talk about, is highly complicated and we knew that going in. But it appears that the last 13 years has proven that finding a treatment or a cure for Alzheimer's has been much harder than we thought. The complexity has been much deeper than we realized. And so that for the past 13 years, the clinical trials that I've been involved with and so many of our participants and families, these trials have failed to, to deliver the treatments that we were hoping for. They have, as we'll talk about, interfered with some of that abnormal biochemistry, but what they haven't done is saved memory yet. I can say that with each failure in these trials, there has been a refinement of the medications that are being tested. There's been a refinement in the way that we measure memory. Um, and there has also been a broadening of the net in terms of trying to attack more angles of the problem. So that with the failures of the last decade, there is now a renewed direction and new strategies born out of the failure, which have an even higher chance of success. Of course, the problem is that these trials, even though they're underway, they can take years to complete. And so the progress which we are seeking is so slow in coming. Today we'll talk about one of the new, one or a few of the news stories that has been out recently, uh, which is again creating new hope uh, in this area. And uh, at the end, of course, we can answer questions as well that you may have. I'm so pleased to work with the Dementia Society. Our clinic at Briere collaborates closely with the Dementia Society uh, in that we can detect Alzheimer's and dementia early. And um, the Dementia Society can support individuals and families who are affected. And so together we are trying to provide coordination so that those who are diagnosed at our clinic treated at our clinic can provide can be provided ongoing support from the dementia society early rather than later so that supports which are so needed for families uh, can be put in place sooner preventing a crisis and allowing as as hard as it is to imagine allowing it one to live well with dementia because until we have that cure, we need to live well with dementia. And we're so pleased to work with the Dementia Society in that regard. Uh, we present the dementia basics in a number of parts. I'll be uh, speaking to part one tonight, which um, covers some of the basic neurology or neuroscience behind the brain and how it gets affected by Alzheimer's disease. The aging brain. Now, of course, all of us are aging. And there is definitely, uh, it's normal to get older, of course. And uh, yet it gives many challenges, including with the brain, in that we can experience memory loss as we get older that can be scary. It can also be uh, frustrating or embarrassing. We'll talk a little bit about that tonight. We'll talk about the uh, anatomy of the brain, which is always so interesting to me as a neurologist to see how the brain is built and how in fact it has evolved over millions of years to do what it does today. And that how as we get older, it can change normally and how we can try to prevent uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. There is uh, on a later night presented by colleagues of mine from our clinic at Briere, 
Uh, part two goes into Alzheimer's disease in greater depth as well as other types of dementia. We might as well uh, pause now and just define these words. Dementia is a memory loss or thinking change which robs us of independence. So dementia has two parts, the memory part and the loss of independence. You have to have both to fulfill that term. It's a very general term because there are many causes of dementia, that is memory loss and loss of independence, such as a stroke, which is vascular dementia. It's a stroke where the blood gets blocked and damages the brain and you can lose memory and independence. Other dementias like Parkinson's disease, which affects walking and movement first, but can also affect memory and independence as well. We call it Parkinson's dementia. The most common type of dementia in the world is known as Alzheimer's dementia. Alzheimer's is a specific buildup of proteins in the brain. You could call them the Alzheimer's proteins. As those Alzheimer's proteins build up, they literally damage the brain. And so if the brain is damaged enough, it causes memory loss and loss of independence. As those proteins keep building up, the memory loss gets worse and worse and the functioning gets worse and worse so that someone may even lose the ability to care for their basic needs like hygiene, dressing, going to the bathroom even, which may require a move to a retirement community or even long-term care. This can take place over 10 years, which is this uh, tragic loss over so many years in Alzheimer's. Uh, Nancy Reagan once called it a long goodbye. And that is caused by the Alzheimer's proteins, which are known as Alzheimer's disease, the most common type of dementia. Part three will focus on research as well. I've touched on that already and I'll touch on it again tonight. In many ways, I wanna sort of cover all of these aspects, both the anatomy of the brain aging, but also a little bit about the Alzheimer's proteins and the research that I've been involved with. So we'll focus or start with the anatomy of the brain. It's, uh, well, about 1.1 liters, four and a half cups in volume, three pounds of weight. And yet it is, well, at least in my opinion, the body's most important organ because it is us. If you change the brain, you change us, who we are. We can't really do a brain transplant because if we removed our brain and put someone else's brain into us, we'd be them, not us anymore. Our body would be theirs. So the brain truly is the most closely linked part of the body that we would call us. It also is one of the highest energy usage organs of the body because it runs our consciousness itself. So in that it uses a large proportion of the oxygen that we take in from our lungs, pumped of course by our heart, and it uses the, a large proportion of the glucose that we mobilize from the food that we eat to generate huge amounts of energy, which is transformed into electrical impulses, almost like a computer network in the, inside our skull, creating all of the aspects of humanity that we often take for granted, that is until we lose them. Here is a picture of the brain. Of course, it's just a drawing. It shows the basic regions of the brain, starting at the bottom here. And I think you can probably see my pointer here. Is that right, Harmon? Do you, do you see my pointer? If you can see the moving pointer, I'm pointing here to the brain stem at the bottom. It's perhaps the first part of the brain to have evolved, not just in humans, but in lower animals as well. This brainstem essentially creates our drive to breathe, our drive to eat. 
uh, our drive to stay alive and find a safe temperature to live in. These uh, essentially developed in lower animals to keep them alive, and we still have those structures in us. Our brain, in fact, is an evolution upon that in which other parts of the brain have been built up on top of the older parts. So while these parts of the brain resemble earlier animals, these other parts built on top of it are new. And so it's almost like you've got a, an old building which was never torn down. It's just that new parts of the brain were built on top of it. And so as we get further and further into the evolutionary tree, eventually culminating with the frontal lobe, which is the last part of the brain, most recent part of the brain to have evolved, uh, it's basically built on top of the parts that came before. Here's another view of the brain from the inside view, as if we've sort of cut the brain down the middle and we're looking at the uh, inner aspect. Um, again, we have the brain stem is removed at the bottom, uh, but the other parts of the brain have been built on top. So here at the back part of the brain, this is the back part of the brain, we have the occipital lobe, which is what gave us vision and human, humans' vision are, is well developed. Here on the side of the brain, the temporal lobe, which refers to the fact that it's under the temple on the side of the head, the temporal lobe uh, was developed to give us emotions and memory. And it's so interesting that memory developed, of course, because if, let's say, we saw something or heard something or sensed something, that was important to our survival, then wouldn't it be helpful to remember that for next time? And with that, life forms, even before humans, of course, I'm talking about um, amphibians, like frogs and reptiles, eventually birds, then mammals, all developing brains like this, were able to sense their environment and then remember what they had seen. This allowed them to survive. And really, evolution, as you know, is about helping us survive. The memories became linked in this temporal lobe to emotions. Again, isn't that interesting? That emotions start to started to develop alongside the memories because you wanted to remember if something was good or bad if it was something that made you feel better or made you feel worse. And that is why, to this day, emotional memories are the strongest ones that we have. When we have an emotion that's linked to a memory, they tend to stick most strongly. Eventually, initially, to help us survive, but today, an integral part of our human existence. The parietal lobe here, developed as a uh, repository of emotional memories if they were created here in the temporal lobe. And here, if I may actually point out this area here, which is right on the inner aspects of the temp the inner aspect of the temporal lobe, known as the hippocampus. It's this bulging area here as part of the temporal lobe, which is the very first location where a memory is born, right here. The reason I bring it to mind is because it is the area that is first affected in Alzheimer's disease. This critical area of the temporal lobe is where memories are born. The emotions are built right here in this yellow area. And they are fed up into this green area here, the parietal lobe, where, where they are saved for the rest of our lives. New memories are built right here in the hippocampus, in the temporal lobe. That is a memory of what you're hearing right now. If you are to remember anything that I say, it, it must be formed in this hippocampus and eventually fed up into the parietal lobe where it may stay with you later, beyond today and beyond next week. 
Further, as the evolution continued, the frontal lobe developed last. The frontal lobe was able to take memories formed here, combined with emotions and sensation from sight and sound, saved in the parietal lobe, and then taken by the frontal lobe and developed into a pattern of our life. That is to say, the complexity of the world and the memories that we have formed needed to be organized into a coherent construct of all of reality. That is to say, who we are as an individual, where we are in space, when we are in time, what was happening to us now, and what we were going to do about it in the future. And so all of the most human aspects of intelligence come from this evolution of this marvel of nature. It truly must be called a marvel in that it has allowed us to sense our environment, understand it, remember it, and then form patterns for the future and a plan of action. That is what made humans most human and even further allowed us to connect to others because out of the frontal lobe came the ability not just to understand what did happen but what might happen in the future and in fact what others might be thinking of us this led to humankind cooperating with others and the formation of civilization the history of the human world is written in the structures that you see before you that have developed over millions and millions of years. And as I said before, we often take it for granted. All of our abilities and our consciousness and our memories and our language and our art and our philosophy and religion. But we take it for granted until we lose it. And that is dementia and Alzheimer's is the most common cause of disease that takes those things away. And as I mentioned, it starts right here in the hippocampus where new memories are made. And that is why the very first symptom of Alzheimer's disease starts to begin with forgetting recent memory, memory from five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago may be completely erased and and the, there's just simply no recall later on the difference between that kind of memory loss and the memory loss of normal aging is that as we get older we may forget things but if given a clue or even given a bit of time it will come back to us it just takes a bit of time the brain is a bit, of, a bit slower, if you will, as we get older. But in Alzheimer's, as this biochemistry that we'll talk about, the Alzheimer's proteins, start to take hold first in the temporal lobe, in the hippocampus, the memories are not created at all. And so no matter how many clues are given, no matter how much time is given, people cannot remember. There is a complete erasure of that memory. Unfortunately, as the protein continues to accumulate in Alzheimer's, more and more parts of the brain start to become affected. The next part of the brain that's affected is the parietal lobe, where older memories start to be affected. Words are affected. Then the frontal lobe gets affected. So the ability to see the patterns and, and problem solving of life starts to break down and people lose their ability to function to take care of themselves in a complicated world and this takes place over 10 years a slow moving biochemistry if only we could interfere with that abnormal biochemistry and early perhaps we could save the brain so that we could live a full life without having to experience a long goodbye that is our dream 
Here is a microscopic drawing of the neuron, which is a microscopic brain cell. Our brain has billions of these cells. So they are microscopic, could only be seen under the microscope. They are tiny, but they connect to their neighbors. So if you put a billion of these brain cells together into a brain, they speak to each other, almost like computers speak to each other with telephone wires or internet cables. And together, billions of brain cells talking to each other creates a full on planetary internet of brain cells. An internet of billions of brain cells speaking to each other, which together do have the complexity in this, in this massive mathematical expanse to support fu um, the functions which underlie consciousness itself. All of the consciousness and language and memory that I described before can in fact be supported by billions of brain cells connected to each other in an internet of brain cells within our skull. Of course, if the proteins of Alzheimer's accumulate and start to damage these cells and cause them to retract all of these terminals, they can no longer connect to their neighbors, the network is destroyed, and so all the function is destroyed. This is the physical reality which causes the memory loss of Alzheimer's because we see it on the outside as a memory loss, but on the inside, there is a physical microscopic biochemical reality, which is causing these cells to lose their connection with their neighbors. And as that happens, the, the functioning, the memory, the thinking slowly starts to be eroded and lost. And so we start with billions that we're born with, and as we get older, we start to lose those cells. And if we lose enough of them, then the symptoms of dementia develop. How do these cells connect with each other? This is the basic science of the synapse, the connection between our billions of brain cells with each other. All of this is microscopic too. It's based on neurotransmitters, which are released by one brain cell to stimulate the next one, the neighbor. There are billions of brain cells and trillions and trillions of connections. And each one sends out these chemicals to stimulate their next, the next, the neighbor. Some, some chemicals cause the neighbor to increase its activity. Some transmitters decrease the neighbor's activity. So the complexity is increased multiple fold. And that is why these, this network can in fact create consciousness itself. It has sufficient complexity in all of these cells and transmitters to create all aspects of the human condition. Here's a drawing again, showing them all suspended by the matrix around them. And these are all microscopic. So we have billions of these, which are spread across the entirety of the surface of our brain, known as the cerebral cortex, in all of those lobes of the brain that I described before, which have evolved over millions of years. It's so essential for these brain cells to be within distance of each other. That's where the synapses occur. As the chemistry of Alzheimer's develop, all of those terminals retract as the brain cells here can no longer support them. And when the connections are lost, the functions are lost. Here is a familiar picture, the, the lungs of the human body. The lungs themselves are a complex organ which have developed over millions of years as well. And their purpose, of course, is to bring the oxygen from our atmosphere into our blood. And why does the oxygen have to get into our blood? It's, of course, to be pumped by the heart to the entirety of the body. Here, 
the heart here pumping blood to the oxygen to the lungs first to get the oxygen the blood then returns to the heart so here you can see the the blue blood without oxygen is being pumped by the, the right side of the heart to the lungs where it receives oxygen that we breathe the blood then now now red in color. Uh, it's not quite this way in the body, but for this diagram, it starts blue without oxygen, red with oxygen, then returns back to the heart after visiting the lungs, where the left side of the heart then pumps the oxygen blood to the entire body. And very critically, it sends it to the brain. The oxygen is so essential to the brain. Why is that? Because the fuel of the brain glucose or sugar, which we derive from all the food that we eat. The glucose, which is also carried to the brain by the heart, the glucose needs oxygen to maximize its energy release. Glucose contains oxygen in its structure. But to release that, ox that energy in full, oxygen, O2, is required for that energy release to be maximized. And goodness gracious, you can imagine how much energy the brain is using to maintain those transmitters, which are sent between all those billions of brain cells, which then trigger, in fact, microelectric signals within those brain cells to continue the message to the next brain cell, to the next brain cell, in a massive internet of circuits in the brain. Huge amounts of energy needed, requiring significant amounts of glucose and significant amounts of oxygen. Those two together are essential, and the lungs and the heart get the oxygen to the brain. As you know, if the oxygen or glucose is cut off for even minutes, the brain will start to shut down, sometimes even in seconds. If we faint and say lose consciousness and fall to the ground, if we faint, it is because the oxygen was not being pumped sufficiently to the brain because perhaps the heart was having difficulty or the blood pressure dropped. We don't want the blood pressure to be too high, but it can't be too low either because if the brain is prevented or deprived from its oxygen or glucose for even minutes or seconds, it will start to shut down. That's how dependent it is on the fuel supply. Look at this. This is, in fact, the blood flow into the brain. It looks like a tree. In fact, I suspect the same genetics which go into building what a tree is, is shared by us even in the animal kingdom, to develop a tree of blood vessels which carry the oxygen and glucose to all parts of the brain, starting with a trunk here, like a tree, and then progressively branching into smaller and smaller branches that carry the oxygen and glucose to the brain. This, of course, is a side view of the, the human skull with the face here and jaw here with this white, huge blood vessel carrying oxygenated blood directly from the heart. The blood, cell, the blood enters the brain through capillaries, which are small, uh, eventually small branches with blood, and they, the oxygen crosses what's called the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is created by the brain to prevent poisons from getting into the brain. This astrocyte is actually lining the blood vessels to prevent any poisons from getting through. But the oxygen and glucose do get through and support the astrocytes in their role and, of course, enters the neuron, that branched brain cell that I showed earlier, uh, where it takes the glucose and the oxygen to generate the, ox the energy it needs to form connections with its neighbor. And if that happens billions of times over, we have human consciousness. The brain itself is only 2% of the body weight, but look, it takes 15% of all output of the heart. It takes 20% of all the oxygen in the body and 25% of the glucose. You could call it an energy hog, but for good reason, because look at all that it creates. 
it creates us. As we move on, we define the word cognition. Perhaps another related term is intelligence. Cognition is thought. And here are all the parts of thought that we often, again, take for granted until it's taken away. Memory is, of course, what happened recently, but also, which is short-term memory, but also long-term memory, which is what happened years or decades ago. Orientation, as I mentioned, it's who we are, consciousness, in where we are and when we are. Concentration is the ability to focus, of course, on what might be most important. Because if we cannot concentrate, it is difficult to form those memories or understand what's happening. Language, of course, are words. Not just our words, but our way of our tone of voice. So language comes through not only in our words, but in how we say it, and also in sign language and other forms of communication. Even numbers are a kind of language, all designed to communicate how we are thinking, but of course, connecting with others. Visuospatial is the ability to navigate in our world, indicating that our, our vision has turned out to be one of our most important senses. Other animals have other senses which are more important. For the human being, it is vision and our navigation that comes with it. And ultimately, all of this, the memory, the concentration, language, and our sense of space come together in executive functioning, which is the frontal lobe, where all of the memories and information and thoughts and words come together to help us form a pattern of what's happening so that we can understand what's happening now and we can make plans for the future. The executive functioning also allows us try to try to understand what others are thinking so that we can cooperate with others, which again underlies the evolution of the human species itself in generating sim civilization, allowing us to inhabit essentially the entirety of planet Earth. So while memory is so central to what may be lost early in Alzheimer's, executive functioning represents the pinnacle of thinking uh, of the human being. And so to review, the brainstem and the cerebellum help us um, find food and breathe and live. But the temporal lobe generates the, the, the emotions and memory, the occipital lobe, the vision, the parietal lobe, the long-term memory, and the frontal lobe, the executive functioning and human understanding. Hearing, as I mentioned, visions at the back, hearing comes from the side, vision from the back, executive functioning at the front. Language, in fact, is on the outside of the left side of the brain, on the temporal and parietal lobe language. You may remember that view from the inside. That's where the hippocampus was. That's right here on the inside part of the purple temporal lobe here. That's where the hippocampus and new memories are made. And again, the vision at the back. Orientation is probably diffusely coded, and that's, of course, our awareness of who, where, and when we are. To review, on the inside aspect of the temporal lobe, that's where the uh, memories are born, the hippocampus. The reason I've continued to underscore it is that's where Alzheimer's disease proteins first attack and causing the short-term memory loss at the beginning. Unfortunately, though, as I mentioned, as the proteins start to develop, develop everywhere, even the executive functioning of the frontal lobe can also be affected later on. Here's smell, olfaction. It's in the frontal lobe, the bottom part of the frontal lobe as well. It's right next to the hippocampus, which is why uh, the sense of smell can be affected in many individuals with Alzheimer's disease. 
it's break time. We've covered a lot in terms of the evolution of the human brain, but also the threat to it posed by Alzheimer's. Herman, what do you think? How long should we break or should we continue on? I think it's good to continue. I think it's uh, probably better. Why don't we, cannot, we continue we cannot, on? We cannot read the room, but... <laughs> You're right. Why don't we continue <laughs> on? Of course, people, people yeah. can take breaks on their own. Uh, yeah. And then maybe there'll be a bit more time for questions at the end. Yeah, we have a Q&A. Yeah, perfect. Sounds good. All right, so let's return. I think it's this. Are you able to continue? I press the advance. Try again. Okay. Well, here is uh, some actual photographs of the brain that I've been talking so much about. I know many people would find this sort of gross. Um, you know, of course, it has the reason it has all of these, uh, well, noodle like the brain known as the noodle, is that essentially the brain is trying to pack as much of itself into the skull as it can. So it has all of these undulations, which allow more of it to fit inside the skull, which can only be so big, as we know, for survival and weight. On the left, as you, can, as you can imagine, is the normal brain from the side view and top view. But on the right, if there is Alzheimer's and these proteins are damaging the brain cells and they are retracting all of their billions of connections, the brain literally gets smaller collectively. And all of those undulations become very pronounced, almost divots like between the connections, between the undulations where the brain used to be, it is now no longer there. And as the connections fail, so too do the functions that we've described. As we age normally, as I mentioned, it is very normal for all of us to experience memory loss. The difference is, is that as we get older, it is possible for us to remember what we forgot it just takes a bit longer. So the word that we were struggling to remember should come back later. It just may take a bit longer. Or why we went into a room. It's so frustrating, that senior moment, as it's called. Although anyone can experience that at any age, to be honest. That why we went into a room, it may well come back to us later if we retrace our steps. It just took a bit longer to remember. We didn't totally forget it. All of those are signs of normal aging, even though these memory symptoms are frustrating or embarrassing. That's very normal. And this would likely cause little impact on our day-to-day -day functioning. We just have to give it a bit more time. However, if the memory loss is worse and we're not able to remember what we forgot, ever, or if we even forget that we forgot at all, that, is, that means, that is to say that we aren't even aware that we forgot, because we forgot that we forgot. That is much more significant and serious. In those situations, no matter how many clues are given, one will not remember what they forgot, because there was no memory formed at the hippocampus in the temporal lobe. Age doesn't make you forgetful. Having way too many stupid things to remember makes you forgetful. Maybe. Maybe that's true. As our brain gets full, it is harder to remember. That's true. But she is aging normally. And I have a feeling that if I asked her to remember something, if I gave her enough time, she would remember. She would remember. Now, why she's at a, 
at a uh, amusement park here, I'm not sure. Maybe it represents the ups and downs of life and the ups and downs of memory too. Another sort of rule of thumb that I always use is, is that if you remember that you're forgetting, that is to say, you know you're forgetting and it bothers the heck out of you, yeah. that is a good sign. That means you are remembering that you're forgetting. But if you are forgetting that you're forgetting, that is to say, you're not aware of it, but others around you are saying that you're forgetting and it's news to you and because you're not aware of it, that is more serious. So if you're aware of your forgetfulness, that's usually a good sign. But if you're not aware of it, that's often a sign that it's more serious. Maybe even the first signs of Alzheimer's. At our clinic, we test for Alzheimer's using basic memory tests to check to see who may have Alzheimer's and who may only be experiencing the effects of normal aging. As our brain gets older, so too does our lungs, so too do our lungs. With decreased airflow, less gas exchange and less of that oxygen in the blood. And that's one of the reasons why we, of course, we dissuade from smoking and of course, uh, cessation of smoking is so important, not just for the lungs, but for the heart too and the brain. As much as the brain can change, look at how the lungs can change as well. Circulation, the blood vessels, the vascular system, it's known as. Of course, it runs through the lungs, but also through the heart and up into the brain, as we showed. As we get older, there is less blood flow. There's less output of the heart, less, um, well, narrowing of the blood vessels themselves, thickening of those walls with the aging process. Therefore, there's less flow of blood, less exchange of oxygen and glucose through the blood vessel walls. And we try to decrease the limit of aging. We, we try to decrease the effect of aging on the blood flow by managing these conditions, which clearly damage the blood vessels. High blood pressure or hypertension damages the blood flow with every beat of the heart. So controlling blood pressure into that normal range, because of course we don't want the blood pressure to go too low either, because we need that oxygen and glucose supply. But by keeping blood pressure in that middle range, then we can decrease damage that occurs to the blood flow. And cholesterol, which essentially deposits in the blood vessels, that has to be controlled as well to keep the blood vessels open. Diabetes is control of blood sugar. Of course, blood sugar can't go too low. As we mentioned, that's critical for energy. But blood sugar, blood sugar cannot go too high either because that directly damages the blood vessels as the blood sugar deposits in the blood vessel wall, just like the cholesterol. Blood sugar itself can be toxic like cholesterol when it's too high. All of this is to maintain good blood flow so there's strong oxygen and glucose flow to the brain. Ultimately, because the brain is us and we want to keep it healthy as long as possible. In addition to ma managing blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, and smoking cessation, we, of course, want to have a healthy diet. It is believed that the Mediterranean diet, which involves um, healthy, healthy meats like fish and poultry, not as much red meat, lots of fruits and vegetables with simple sugars, and not as much processed complex sugars, lower salt to keep blood pressure down, maybe a little bit of red wine to act as an antioxidant. This Mediterranean diet is felt to maintain the blood vessel walls better than any other diet, especially the Western diet, which has a lot of processed sugar and salt. That is worse for the, the heart and brain. Sleeping has emerged as another very important lifestyle factor. 
conditions like obstructive sleep apnea, which decrease oxygen all night long through snoring and disruption of sleep, also negatively affects oxygen and circulation, damaging the heart and the brain. Health monitoring, yes, but also physical activity like walking. Walking is normally considered a physical activity for the body, but it helps the brain too because it gets that circulation moving through the brain as well as the heart. Cognitive exercises like hobbies and games, anything creative. While reading is excellent, writing is even better. Learning a new skill, taking up a new hobby. All of this is extremely creative and stimulates the hippocampus to make new memories. As the brain uses its connections, those connections between those many brain cells strengthen and makes them more resilient to the effect of these Alzheimer proteins, which we believe are at the heart of Alzheimer's disease, causing those connections to retract. So if we make more connections, there are more of them and more cognitive reserve, which makes the brain more resilient to disease. Social engagement, which has been so terribly taken away from us during the COVID period. Social engagement is an excellent mental and physical activity, which we want to use as a way to strengthen the brain in the face of getting older, which is inevitable with the passage of time. Here's a figure I've never fully, well, having a look at it, it seems to indicate that if you get too little sleep, dementia goes up. If you get too much sleep, dementia seems to go up. I have a feeling what this shows is that if we have too few hours of sleep, especially if we have a condition like sleep apnea, which robs us of quality sleep, it damages the brain. So we need enough hours of quality sleep. What I think this is showing is that as dementia is developing, it causes the brain to sleep more than it used to. Perhaps because it, the brain defaults into sleep in those with dementia. If there's no activities underway, then the, an individual may not have the volition or initiative to start their own activities so they may sleep more. So more sleep may not be a cause of dementia. It might be an effect of dementia is more sleep. Sleep is so interesting in that as we have deep sleep, which can be taken away in sleep apnea, but if we treat sleep apnea or don't, don't have sleep apnea, we can enjoy what's known as deep sleep. And deep sleep, it has been shown, has significant pulsations of the blood within the brain. And that pulsation is good for circulation, but it's also a way for the brain to pulsate the fluid around it, the cerebrospinal fluid, during deep sleep. It's, all, it's actually been shown that the pulsation of these, of the fluid in deep sleep, actually can wash proteins from the brain. Those excess Alzheimer's protein I talked about, they accumulate and it, deep sleep may well be a kind of pulsation or washing of the brain, of these proteins. So I can, you can almost see the image of the brain washing itself of the excess proteins during sleep. It's another reason why sleep is so important and why exercise is so important because the circulation also helps flush out excess proteins from the brain. And these proteins are at the heart of Alzheimer's disease when they accumulate. Diet, well, it's the Canada Food Guide, but we know this well. I talked about the Mediterranean diet and a lot of this is based on that. These healthy proteins, light meats, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, not as much processed sugar and not high salt. Make water your drink of choice. It's so interesting because while fruit juices are healthy in the sense they contain vitamin C, they do contain a high amounts of sugar as well. So if you were to say, eat an orange versus drinking a glass of orange juice, 
eating the orange is healthier every time. As we, um, okay, so as we age, we lose some of the brain, the lung function. Again, we maintain our exercise stamina for this very reason. Even just walking 20 minutes at a time can help save the lungs. Even just walking three times a week can save the lungs, the heart, and the brain. 20 minutes a day, three times a week can make all the difference. And it's true for the heart too. Just 20 minutes at a time, three times a week. Of course, if you would like to walk longer, more times than three, of course, more is better, but it doesn't take much to make a huge difference. And you don't have to be a marathon runner to have a healthy heart. Even a little can go a long way. Here's a study that showed that 20 minutes per, per session increased gray matter, which in fact are the brain cells in the brain. And that's, that's just walking. Something as simple as walking can make a huge difference. So you add on top of that mental and social activities when we're allowed to, and it can, can significantly increase brain health and create resilience towards uh, diseases like Alzheimer's. Cognitive, cognitive exercises. We all, we engage in cognitive exercises anytime that we're uh, engaged in a hobby uh, or a game, or again, as I say, learning a new skill. The, uh, there are what are called computerized brain games. This Brain HQ product is one product that does seem to have some scientific evidence behind it. Another more famous one is called Lumosity, which actually has less scientific evidence behind it. These are computerized cognitive games. I support them in that some evidence shows that they may delay the onset of dementia. Not everyone enjoys computerized gaming. But these are computerized exercises, which uh, are designed for adults, are on your computer. They do uh, require a subscription fee, um, but what well, they can be tried for free initially. And in general, I support the idea because if they use technology to give focused cognitive exercise, they may well provide the brain the opportunity to maintain its connections and therefore decrease the incidence of dementia over time. So physical activity, mental activity, social activity. And of course the COVID-19 epidemic has taken so much of this away. We look forward to the day that we'll be safe to go out again, sooner rather than later, that's for sure. How can this be? The truth is that even as we get older, we do lose thousands of brain cells every day normally. I know this is a shock, but it's true. As we get older, some of our cells are lost normally in our brain. And they're not replaced because brain cells, unlike other kinds of cells in the body, do not divide and they cannot replace themselves. But we have billions of them. So even losing thousands at a time do not necessarily take away functioning. In fact, the brain cells that remain respond to the exercises that we give them. And the remaining brain cells create more connections to essentially compensate for those brain cells that are lost. So ultimately, even though brain cells are lost as we age, the number of connections increase and that way, we can age successfully, maintaining our brain cells, and in fact, even learning new things as we get older. 
it is possible to teach an old dog new tricks, no matter what you've heard. We can always learn as we get older, at any age. The term used is plasticity, that the brain can change itself and grow these new connections, even if some of the brain cells are being lost. And so it's never too late to learn something new. This again is the image of these brain cells microscopically connecting to their neighbors with electrical and chemical connections. And even if some brain cells are lost, the ones that remain will send out new projections to the neighbors to compensate as we learn. So with that, we've reached the end of this survey of the anatomy and evolution of the brain and how the Alzheimer's process can damage it. Alzheimer's, as I mentioned, is a buildup of two proteins, the amyloid and tau proteins, they've come to be known. These proteins start normally in the brain and have a very important function in keeping the brain structure alive. But in some individuals, sometimes those with a family history of Alzheimer's, will develop too much of these proteins for reasons that we don't fully understand. And these proteins, when there's too much of them, lose their therapeutic value and start to become toxic. As the brain cells continue, as the brain cells continue to accumulate too much of these amyloid and tau proteins, the brain cells are killed at a much higher rate. And the brain cells that are left cannot compensate. And as the connect are lost, the functions are lost, first in the short-term memory in the hippocampus, and then later with executive functioning and problem solving over a period of three to ten years, which can take away all this, all our functioning and our independence and who we are. Our dream, of course, is to find a way to stop these proteins from accumulating, to detect Detect them early, at the earliest stages of symptoms, and then to begin treatments which remove these proteins from the brain. They may be flushed out during deep sleep. They may be removed during exercise. But what we want is a potent, a potent medication which can cross the blood-brain barrier and stick to the proteins which are building up and pull them out of the brain. We have developed treatments to do just that. But over the past five to seven years, we have had a very difficult time in proving that they work. I began our talk describing how it's been very difficult to bring a new treatment for Alzheimer's disease to the world. But with each failure, the treatments for these proteins have been refined, the dosages have been increased safely, of course. Like with all of the COVID vaccine clinical trials currently underway, the same, the same standards of safety are being applied to the Alzheimer's disease drug trials. So that with safety, we are trying to increase the doses yet higher to remove yet more protein at earlier and earlier stages of the condition in hopes of saving memory. In fact, recently, while the earlier trials were focused on removing that first protein in Alzheimer's known as amyloid, which accumulate in what are called the plaques, we are now starting new clinical trials which are attacking the second major protein of Alzheimer's known as tau, which accumulate into what are known as tangles in the brain. And so while some of the earlier trials attacking amyloid have failed, we are now beginning phase two, if you will, of attacking the tau tangle protein. And the clinical trials of that effort will start to become known to the world over the next three to five years. So while the last five years have not delivered success, 
we truly hope that the next five years will deliver the success that we so desperately need. With that, Herman, I will open uh, the floor to questions.